Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. CPBF is a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies through support and education. This is the first premier chat of November, the month we celebrate the World Prematurity Day. CPBF has joined the global call to action, Act Now, Keep Parents and Babies Born uh, Too Soon Together. As we know, COVID-19 pandemic brought an extraordinary challenge to families of preterm babies. Neonatal units worldwide adopted strict safety measures that often separated parents from their newborns in their ICU. Studies have shown time and time again that separation between parents and babies can cause severe and long-term health and developmental issues in newborns and also affect parents' mental health in lasting ways. CPBF is advocating for every parent's right to have unrestricted access to their babies in hospital, no matter where and when. On November 17th, we will bring this message on a big live event, a special edition of the Premier Chats with guests from different parts of the world. Experts, families, healthcare providers will join us to share the latest developments in science, personal stories, and valuable information to our community. Registration is free, and you can check on our website, canadianpremies.org, for all details and activities on November 17th. And I'm going to share with you a special message today for a little boy who was born preterm, and he's been advocating and raising awareness on prematurity. In November, we will spread awareness and love because it is World Prematurity Day. World Prematurity Day is a day to celebrate all the preemies who were born. One in ten babies is born prematurely, and that is why it is so important. On this day, you can wear purple and donate money to the cause. See you on November 17th. Bye. And all of you can join uh, at the conversation on our social media channels and use the hashtag World Prematurity Day 2021. And today we're going to talk about redefining outcomes that are meaningful to parents. Clinicians and researchers have traditionally described the outcomes of premise in terms of neurodevelopmental use, uh, using categories such as severe, moderate, and mild impairment. Parents have never been asked what outcomes matter to them and whether they agree with the medical categories used. In this talk, uh, Dr. Sims will present recent results from the parent ethics studies on the perspectives of parents of preemies and other stakeholders on what can be defined as meaningful outcomes. And I have here joined me live from Vancouver, oh, Dr. Anne Sims, who is a neonatologist and clinical professor. She worked as a neonatologist in Montreal from 1994 to 1999, and at the BC Women's Hospital from 1999 until her retirement in May this year. She's currently a researcher at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. Her research interests include the longer term outcomes of the NICU graduates, especially those born extremely free term, quality improvement, and patient-oriented research. She was on the steering committee of the Canadian Neonatal Network and is the founding director of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network. Dr. Sins, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's such a special month, and I think it is a uh, talk is so appropriate to raise awareness on prematurity and the long-term outcomes of our babies. So welcome. Dr. Sins, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Fabiana. Um, so often we only have the um, opportunity to talk to healthcare professionals, and yet it is the patients, the families, um, and other lay people who need to hear our, our story as, um, as well. Um, so I will now, uh, yes, you can share my slide. Absolutely. And uh, for all of you watching us live from home, uh, on the hospital, uh, please send your questions, your comments on the chat box below. We will address them at the end of Dr. Sin's presentation. Uh, you can, uh, go full screen now. Yes. I thought it was full screen. Okay. I'll go. 
Oh, we practiced this. Um, <laughs> it's okay. We can uh, try again. Oh, okay. I'll have to close it down again because now it doesn't want to go. Oh. There. How's that? Okay. It's not full <laughs> screen. Can you let let's oh. play, yeah play from start now? Uh, because I've got my um slideshow going and it's full size on my screen. Okay. Not uh, for us. So I can share the slides for you, Doctor Sings, if you okay. want. That's why we had our backup plan. <laughs> exactly. So maybe you can stop sharing our screen. Yeah. Okay. It happens. The technology, it's good. <laughs> okay, here you go. Okay. Um, so today I wanted to talk about redefining outcomes that are meaningful to parents. Um, next slide. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I was born preterm in the um, in the 1950s, and at the time, 32 weeks doesn't seem like it's that um, preterm. But if you put in the context of what's happened with um, how we provide care to preterms, um, it's a bit of a different story. Next slide. So up and Till the 1950s, there weren't that much we could do for preterm babies. Um, these are old pictures showing that there were traveling circuses with preterm babies in um, in incubators, um, which was sort of the earliest starts to um, care for preterm babies. And on the next slide, um, it wasn't until the 1960s that we started to have um, ventilators and neonatal intensive care units. Um, next slide. Um, so if for very preterm um, babies back in the 1950s, um, the mortality rate was about 95%. Um, but as you get up to around 2000, um, there was less than 20% um, who succumbed. And hence, um, there's a new era of new survivors of the over 80% of babies who actually um, survived. Um, next slide. Um, so I was lucky to be able to join um, Shu Lee's um, group in the Canadian neonatal network where now that there were um, all these preterm babies surviving, um, we wanted to know how they were doing. And in the Canadian neonatal network, we were able to collect information about um, how things were going when they were in the neonatal intensive um, care unit. But next slide. Um, we, of course, wanted to know what happens after they came home from the neonatal intensive care unit because they still had uh, a full life in, in front of them. Um, so working with um, Shu, I was able to start the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network um, and get collaboration from um, all 25 sites across Canada. Um, and really, we wanted to look at how we could improve the quality of um, care and long-term outcomes of children seen in their um, neonatal follow-up programs, um, and we focused on children born preterm. Um, next slide. Um, so we were able to get some um, funding from um, CIHR, the Canadian Institute for Health um, Research, and had um, the funds and the collaboration across the country um, to offer a visit to all, baby, um, all families um, of a child um, who was less than 29 weeks gestation. 
and we were able to um, link the information that we got from their visit at 18 months to how they were doing um, in the nursery through the Canadian Neonatal Network. And, and this first um, study, what we called the MyCare cohort, maternal infant care, um, we have information from um, 2009 to 2011. And after that, um, uh, we have been able to continue this um, data collection. Next slide. Um, now, pragmatically, we had to look at what information was available in our participating follow-up programs. Um, and so we um, used what was available, um, which was at a visit of 18 to 21 months corrected age, in other words, um, 18 to 21 months after their expected date of birth, not their actual date of birth, we were able to um, be able to describe hearing and vision, uh, whether they had cerebral palsy, how severe cerebral palsy if they had it, um, and a standard test looking at child um, development called the Bailey um, Scales of Infant and Toddler Development, third edition or Bailey 3 for short, um, to look at language, cognitive, in other words, their thinking and motor, and how, which is how they um, children move. Next slide. Um, and once we had this information, um, we've been able to um, uh, publish the results in our CN Fund um, annual uh, reports. Next slide. Um, but obviously we had to decide what information do we put in our research? What information do we put in the annual report? And so I looked to all the experts around the world, other um, networks around the world, and um, came up with these definitions. Um, and I, the first presentation I gave, I, um, I called it severe neurodevelopmental impairment, but I had feedback from parents um, after the talk and said, we're not sure, we don't like this term severe. So we agreed to call it significant, and that's what we've put in our publications and reports. Um, and significant um, was used to describe um, children who had one or more of the following problems. They had a severe cerebral palsy. Um, on the Bailey 3, their development was um, in the bottom 2.5% of uh, what is typical for either their motor, cognitive, or language um, abilities, um, and if they had a hearing aid or cochlear implant, we called that a significant hearing impairment, um, and if they were um, blind um, in both eyes, we called that a bilateral visual impairment. Now, we also recognized, like um, others around the world, that it was important to capture um, less severe problems because they would be outcomes that we would want to um, improve. Um, so next slide. Um, so that's what we've used um, so far, but right from the early days, um, I and others had some questions about whether this was the right thing to do. So, for example, in CN Fun, when we were developing um, the database and talking to the clinicians across the country, they said, well, you know what, at 18 months, we often can't tell for sure whether a child has cerebral palsy. So we created a category that we called suspected cerebral palsy when it wasn't clear that they fit into either the no CP or CP category. Um, and what we found was that there were actually 3.6% of the population 
who um, were in this um, uncertain category. Um, and, you know, when you're doing research, you then don't know, should we put them, combine them with the kids with CP, um, which would be meant that there were 10 percent or if we don't it's 6.4 percent which can be a big um difference next slide um and working in the follow-up program in vancouver looking at children from all of british columbia um there were other confusing results so when we looked at um a group of kids born weighing less than 800 grams from 1983 to 2003 and we looked how things changed over time when we looked at the bailey and it was a, a earlier version um both their thinking and motor abilities um were more likely to be low as time went on yet when we looked at um, measured IQ, when the kids were about four and a half years old, um, we could see over time that um, low IQ scores were less frequent. So that didn't really match. Next slide. Um, and Similarly, when we looked at cerebral palsy, we were encouraged that the number of um, proportion of kids with cerebral palsy um, from the early 80s um, up to 2003 was becoming less frequent. But when we looked at the Bailey 3 scores, um, the scores were getting lower um, as time progressed. But I mean, it really highlights that cerebral palsy does not um, is not the best measure of how children are doing with their movement skills. Um, and there are other conditions such as um, something called developmental coordination disorder that are also um, important. Um, so a couple of questions there. Next slide. And then um, what um, I we did with CN Fun is we said, well, let's just make sure that the definition of what we've been calling severe or significant, how does that match with what's being used around the rest of the world? And it was a bit of a surprise and a concern to see that using the definition I've showed you, we found that 14.9% um of our very preterm population uh, met this criteria um but if we looked at the more stringent criteria used by the australian new zealand neonatal network um based on their definition applied to our uh data there would only be three and a half percent. So that's a more than fourfold difference depending upon what definition of severe. And um, and I'm convinced that if we talk to neonatologists across the world, they, um, they will think that if you say severe, that that all means the same thing, which we have therefore shown is not true. Next slide. So it was um, very fortunate and, and timely when we had the opportunity um, to join um, Childbright, which is a patient-oriented uh, research network um, looking at um, brain-based um, disabilities as one of 13 um, projects. Next slide. Um, and I'm going to focus today on the first aim of the studies done with um, Child Bright. And the fun and exciting thing about this team is it, it includes parents such as Kate Robson, who was the director of um, CPBF at the time, um, Rebecca Pierce, another parent, 
um, as well as um, various neonatologists, um, ethicists, parents um, across the country, um, as well as a number of um, students. Next slide. And coming into this project, um, they really opened my eyes to um, a different way of thinking about um, outcomes and uh, that the way we've been thinking of it uh, probably does not reflect the values of parents. Um, and Dr. Annie Jambier, who is both a neonatologist and a parent of a preemie, um, I, I love this slide that um, she has given with um, our talks um, about a very different way of thinking about it. And in summary, she says, do the parents of preterm children love and value them? And the answer is of course, yes. Next slide. Um, so in this um, parent epic, we had th um, three aims and I'm gonna focus on the first aim, which was the need to define outcomes that are meaningful to parents. Um, Maybe at another occasion, I'll be able to tell you about our second aim where we were looking at, well, how can we actually improve cognitive and language abilities in children born very preterm? And our third aim allowed us to evaluate the outcomes and um, publish it in um, our annual report. Next slide. Um, now, uh, even though we didn't have a lot of experience with um, patient research, we were struck by the fact that it would be important to capture both um, a wide range of parent opinions as well as go into depth with um, a smaller number of patients. So we therefore um, used a variety of um, studies to get a more comprehensive um, picture. And I'll take you through these different studies. And what we're doing right now is we're analyzing and looking at those results so that we will be able to revise the data collected by CN Fund, um, revise the definitions that we've used, um, apply it to annual report and um, our research. And we hope to spread um, our findings um, uh, across other to other countries as well. Next slide. Um, so in our first step where we wanted to capture a broad number of parents and make it as easy as possible for them, um, our coordinator, Lindsay Richter, has been uh, leading this study um, where we wanted to examine whether parents agree with the um, classification that we've been using by CN Fund. So at the vis at before um, parents saw the healthcare providers at the follow-up um, visit at 18 months, we just asked them um, a simple question and uh, about how they perceived their child's development, whether it was um, they thought the child was developing normally or whether they had a mild, moderate or severe impairment. Next slide. Um, the results showed that the agreement between um, parents' perceptions and our um, CN fund classification was not very good. Um, it, we used something called the Kappa's um, uh, test, which showed that it was 0.29, which is only um, fair. Next slide. Um, and we look, when we look um, more carefully um, at uh, the discrepancies between the two in orange across the diagonal are the numbers where there was um, agreement between parents and CN fund. But in the top right hand corner, um, which is a larger num a number of um, responses, um, the parents felt that their child's um, development um, was less severe than what CN Fund classified them as. Next slide. Um, in this um, next study, um, a, our summer student, Amarpreet Chera, helped us 
with um, circulating a questionnaire using clinical vignettes. Um, so we had a short description, like you can see here, about an 18-month-old um, child and described their health condition and asked um, respondents about how they perceive um, that health condition, where zero is the worst possible health and 10 is the best possible health. Then we asked explicitly, do you think this describes a severe health condition? Um, and then we explored a bit about um, what parents would want to know um, in the NICU. And we have to thank the Canadian Premature Baby Foundation and, and Prema Quebec, who when COVID um, started, were able to circulate this through, uh, through their, their media. Next slide. Um, so what we um, found is um, that most um, respondents did not find um, that these were severe um, health conditions. Um, and it varied for the cognitive delay, uh, less than 5% thought it was severe. Um, and for the vignette that describes cerebral palsy and language delay, it was about 55% who thought it was severe. Um, and so most therefore did not think of them as severe health conditions. Next slide. And when we looked at the actual um, ratings, what you see in this slide is that between the 10 different vignettes, um, there's a lot of uh, difference um, between the different health conditions um, with cerebral palsy and language um, being ranked the um, uh, less um, positive than cognitive, which was only slightly um, lower than a typically developing child. Next slide. Um, and here, when we ask parents about other outcomes that they would have liked to have known about, um, we can see that either very important or somewhat important are a variety of other um, uh, health conditions such as behavior, feeding, sleeping, growth, um, healthcare visits that were also ranked by um, a majority of people as very important or somewhat important. Next slide. Um, now, at Saint Justine in in Montreal, um, a, they completed this study on parental perspective regarding outcomes of very preterm. Um, infants um, and um, where what they looked at were the the concerns that parents reported about their child and also their best things about their child um, and we wanted to verify and have a closer look at this um, in the following slide uh, studies next slide um, so Odrian Miet um, is another student who worked on this and um, uh, what sh she has summarized were parents' perspectives about both the positive and the negative aspects of their very preterm child's health and development. Um, and she looked at whether that perspective changed depending upon how CN Fun had identified uh, the level of NDI. Next slide. Um, and so. Uh, again, with the help of uh, CPBF, um, she um, an online questionnaire was created, which looked at um, four categories of questions that cover personality and social interactions, the positive aspects about development and physical health, um, parental concerns, um, and mood, comfort, health, and behavior. Next slide. Um, and what you can see um, here is that um, in the dark blue are uh, respondents who strongly agree and the lighter blue goes um, who agree. And um, for both children 
uh, with an NDI and those without um, most agreed, but there were um, more families whose child did not have an NDI, 96% um, agreed compared to 78% where their child um, did have an impairment. Um, and similarly, um, when asked to describe their child's um, physical health, 96% um, with no NDI agreed and 84% um, with an NDI um, agreed. Um, so again, positive for both, but more so if there was no NDI. Next slide. Um, and looking at the positive aspects, it didn't matter uh, whether the child had an impairment or not, um, but uh, everybody um, said that they felt their child was happy, laughs and smiles a lot, um, either strongly or um, agreed with that. Um, and similarly, for their uh, child's positive personality, um, but uh, their um, perspective, whether a child had a positive so social interaction was affected about what, by whether the child had um, an NDI or not. Um, but again, it was 87% versus 95%. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, when asked about whether um, parents had concerns about their child's development, future physical um, health. Um, it was lower in the green bars, which is no NDI, um, compared to children who did have an, um, an NDI. Um, next slide. Um, and the last um, part of the questionnaire um, where a Rebecca Pierce, our parent um, partner, has um, taken the lead on. Um, she looked at a larger sample of parents, um, the age of parents, and got a broader sense of um, concerns and experience. Next slide. Um, and really, overall, um, parents viewed their child's um, health um, as, as very good with a score, a um, median score of nine, um, though we were able to pick up a difference between children who had no NDI and those who had um, a significant um, NDI. Next slide. Um, and when parents were asked if they could improve upon two things about their child's health or development, um, it's important to see that 19% um, felt that nothing um, could be improved. And those who did identify something, it was development um, as we sort of expected, but also their breathing, their respiratory health, um, and nutrition, feeding, and, and growing. Next slide. Um, and as in summary, when um, parents were asked about how it affected their life and their family's life, most families um, respondents said that there were both positive and negative impacts um, on their life in 74%. Um, next slide. Uh, the positive impacts that they reported on their child's birth um, was their positive outlook on life and the gratitude they felt in about um, almost 50%. Um, they felt stronger family connections reported by a third. And um, in 28%, they felt that their child was a gift. Um, next slide. Um, when it came to negative um, impacts, um, what parents reported was um, stress and anxiety um, in 42 percent, 
um, a loss of family balance and equilibrium in 36% um, that their child's development had had a negative impact um, and that um, their sense of a vulnerable child had also had a negative impact um, on their life. Next slide. So in um, summary, we had a workshop um, in September and sort of the conclusions we came to is that severe is a very subjective term and it really should be um, avoided. Uh, no need to use um, disabling or severe hearing loss. Why can't we just describe it as um, the percentage of children who are using hearing aids or cochlear implants? Um, so this will, for example, be brought into our um, upcoming annual report that will be released um, probably in about a month. Um, when we looked at the components of NDI, um, it was clear from the vignette study that they weren't equivalent um, and that there are all kinds of problems trying to use a composite outcome um, and um, this should be avoided whenever possible. We also heard that there are other outcomes besides neurodevelopment that are important, such as feeding, eating, uh, respiratory health impact on the family. Um, and it was clear that um, parents have a balanced perspective on their child and that um, as researchers and healthcare providers, we have only really been reporting on the negative outcomes and we need to add the positive outcomes. Next slide. Now, I want to give you a little glimpse on um, our AIM-2 interventions and the impact it's, it's had, acknowledging the problems we have with which outcome to measure. Um, but these graphs with blue showing NDI or the less severe um, outcomes and red the more severe um, significant outcomes. Um, when it comes to NDI and SNDI, um, in the annual report, it looks like it hasn't changed too much. Um, but Florentia Ricci, um, one of our CN Plan Steering Committee members, um, compared um, outcomes in children born in the years 2009 to 12 versus those born in 2013 to 2016 and adjusted for how premature and other risk factors. And when she did that, um, we were able to find that the chance of um, death or a significant neurodevelopmental impairment um, was 86% lower in the more recent period. Um, so that's good news. Um, in the next two slides, you'll see um, hearing loss has dropped from 2.6 to 1.4 percent. And in Florencia's um, study, um, she found that um, after adjustment for risk factors, the chance of having um, uh, hearing needing hearing aids or cochlear implants is only half of what it was in the earlier time period. Um, even more impressive is um, the improvement in vision, which has gone from 1.4% to 0.6%, where there is a 38% um, um, the risk of a visual loss is 38% compared to the earlier time period. Um, so these are all very um, significant findings when you analyze them statistically. Now, on the opposite side, just like we saw in, um, in British Columbia, um, a low score on the Bailey cognitive um, has gone up over time. Um, and it's 25% higher than it was in the first time period. Um, I don't know, and time will sort of tell, but it's not clear to me that this is actually an outcome um, that is important to parents. 
Um, next slide. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little insight into our interventions um, uh, study, where at, um, at one site, who in um, the years 2009 to 2011, um, and there's a red arrow here that points to them and the fact that their line is above the horizontal line, they had a 36% um, higher incidence of um, significant NDI compared to the other follow-up programs in Canada. But um, they've had a really wonderful group that's been working in the nursery to re um, reduce brain um, injury as measured on head ultrasounds. And they've also been involved in interventions after the children have been go gone home. And in 2012 to 2017, they now have a... Um, the um, seven, they have a 77 percent um, risk of uh, SNDI compared to the rest of Canada. So that's a huge improvement. It's statistically significant. And it really says that there's the opportunity for um, to improve. Um, here I've shown you SNDI, but it holds for other things as well. So they've been able um, to improve outcomes for their children. And if they can do it, we can learn um, from them. Next slide. So take home messages are patients and families are essential partners in deciding what outcomes are important. Um, and they've been um, amazing to work with um, in during our research. Um, CN Fund will incorporate the parent ethic results into future research and annual um, reports. We will avoid using the terms severe, um, NDI, and SNDI. Um, we will add the new outcomes, some such as um, growth. We already have information that can be added, um, and others will have to figure out how to collect. Um, and then um, we want to add positive outcomes um, to our research and annual report, uh, but we'll have to figure out the best way to do this. Uh, I think there's, um, so there's a hope that outcomes are improving and that there is um, potential for us to do um, even better. Next slide. Uh, so I want to acknowledge um, all the wonderful people who have uh, made this research um, possible, and I'm now happy to take any questions. Dr. Singh, thank you so much for your presentation and for this amazing work you are doing. It is uh, truly remarkable how... Uh, one research study that I know is many years of your life and many people involved is going to change the way you see this. But my question to you is because it's November, we are looking to the future. We want to spread hope for families and to our community. How are we going to disseminate these results and actually implement the change the way we do today the way we're not we are not going to talk severe we are not going to talk ngi so how are we going to change that culture uh in the centers when they are talking and referring to families uh, and babies diagnosis thank you for that question um fabiana and i'm so happy that we're working together um because in the past uh, you know, the healthcare professionals was the source of um, most information. But today we live with um, our friend Google and other sources. And so as we have um, discussed, once um, these results, which um, have not been 
um, completed and published yet, but once that's happened, um, we look forward to working with CPBF um, to get this message through via social media available um, in uh, lay language so that everybody can understand it through platforms um, such as the CPBF. Um, so that will be new and exciting. And of course, um, we will be, um, you know, the advantage of having a national network is we have annual meetings. Um, we all work closely with our other healthcare providers. And so we're going to be able to disseminate um, that across Canada quite easily. Um, and the fact that we change our annual report, anybody in Canada who will ask to do a study using our data, we will be able to filter it um, and quite quickly be able to put those results into practice. Absolutely. So we have a comment here from our live audience. Lonnie, thank you for joining us and for sending your question or your comment. Thank you for sharing this encouraging data in a way that is accessible and that parents can easily understand. As a former ICU parent, this would have been something that I would have appreciated in the ICU. I 100% agree with Lonnie. Uh, Dr. Singh, my next question to you is because we are still going to need to uh, measure outcomes among your community of clinicians and researchers. So how do you see that happening? Because among yourselves, you have to have some benchmark. You have to know uh, where you're going and the strides that you've done with the, the change in care. So how are you going to have two definitions? Uh, one that you talk to parents and one among uh, the clinicians and researchers, or are we, how are we going to integrate that? Um, so we had a great workshop in September, and uh, we can learn from, for example, um, the oncology groups, so the um, cancer groups, where uh, they report report not on a severe outcome, but they can make report about, um, you know, the chance of having children if you've had a certain type of cancer. So the first, the simplest thing that we're going to do um, will be, instead of calling things severe, we'll just describe um, an apple for what it is. Um, and the example I used is being able to say, um, what percentage of children need a hearing aid or cochlear implant. Um, and that just, um, that's actually quite easy to do, even if it takes us moving away from the, this, uh, this sense of a need to call something um, severe. Um, and then uh, again, being able to add and say, you know, how many of the children need um, help with feeding with a feeding tube? We can just describe that as it is. We don't have to put a subjective or a negative con connotation um, on that. Um, and being able to compare over time we can still do it using um, a different different label. Um, what will um, be a bit more difficult to, to do is um, there are research um, studies where you have um, trials where um, for statistical reasons, you can't describe a hundred different things. You have to choose a primary um, question you're answering, and that's where, in advance, you might not know. You're just interested in the child's overall well-being. Um, and we're still looking at, you know, what would be the best way um, 
to do that. And in the past, we would use, you know, what's the chance of a significant neurodevelopmental impairment? Um, whether we'll be able to identify, um, for example, a measure of quality of, of life. And the problem is it's more difficult to do that in 18-month-old kids. Um, we might need to change the age we see them, and that comes with other complications. Um, so there's still work to do. Absolutely. Uh, so when you're talking about you're talking about ed, different outcomes such as respiratory issues, feeding, eating, how are we going to do that? Because every child has so many different. Uh, uh, they they differ, right? The respiratory issues differ child to child. The feeding. So how are we going to define those? Well, information that we already have um, is. You know, we know at the more um, severe end, there are some children that go home with um, respiratory support, whether that be extra oxygen, whether that be some form of um, home respiratory support, CPAP, things like that. We have that um, information we've been looking, um, looking at in some of our research projects. Um, and we know from um, the time in the nursery, we have ways of measuring the severity of the lung disease um, during a child hospital um, hospital stay. Um, we have those, so that's that's fairly easy to do um, for things like um, growth. Um, we do measure. Uh, you know, height and weight um, at the visits. Um, and we can um, compare to um, um, growth curves, how kids fit compared to other kids, whether they're average height, whether they're less than average, um, above average. Um, so that information um we have and that would um that we can add in fairly easily um and we know how many kids have uh for example um tube feedings with gastrostomy tubes or g-tubes um and you know and we can look to the future to say do we want to um uh, do parents want us to be able to describe what they see as difficult feeding? Um, can we standardize that so we know what a parent um, who describes difficult feeding, what does that actually mean? Um, so th those are some of the things to come. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, my next question to you is looking to the future. And you, you have so many families listening to us today and you are a premier yourself. And I think actually, thank you for sharing that piece of the story because I think it's so amazing. Uh, listen to your story as a premier. Now you, you work with premiers. I think if I had a neonatologist in the ICU with me who said I was a preemie, it would give me so much hope. And I'm sure over your career, you gave so much hope to your families. Uh, but looking to the future, one message can you tell families and say families that early on in their journeys, uh, sometimes they're still waiting for possible diagnosis and they're scared. We hear this every day in our private parent group that they, they're afraid of hearing a diagnosis. But your talk today gave us so much hope the way families actually have the perspective and perceptions of their children. Uh, not exactly how we, when we receive the diagnosis of news in the hospital. So one message of fam for families listening to us today on this journey. Uh, so I, I think it's thanks to the parents who participate in our study who really said that we need to talk about the positive aspects as well as, you know, the challenges their child might face. Uh, so if as clinicians, we can learn to, um, phrase the positive, um, because it's extremely important, uh, to help our children 
by um, by having hope. Um, if we don't believe in our child, um, they may not have that um, positive influence to um, live up to um, their parents' expectations. Um, what I would often um, do with families is I would give them the message that, you know, their um, role is to be positive, um, to believe in their child, and that as the healthcare team, our job is to put the safety net so that if their if the child does end up needing um, help, um, whether that be with how they move or think or talk or see or hear, whatever, that um, we can be the safety net. Um, and yes, we need to be able to give them factual information, um, but a parent needs to be um, hopeful um, because there's so much that parents can actually do. Um, and hopefully in the future, you'll have us back when we can talk more about um, uh, the, the aim to interventions and what we've been doing um, there to improve outcomes. And parents are the most important um, factor when it comes to helping there. Oh, thank you. That's a beautiful message. For sure, we're going to have you back. And I'm looking forward to working with you for many years here at CPBF and collaborate on your research. I think it's such an important project. And I hope many other countries follow your steps, Dr. Sins. Thank you so much. And happy World Prematurity Day. <laughs> and happy Prematurity Day to everybody else. Thank you. And to all of you watching us live today on Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, the video of today's session and all the videos from our live sessions are available on our uh, website, which is right here, the CanadianPremise.org. I also want to thank our sponsor, AstraZeneca and Water Wives, for their ongoing support to our education sessions. And CPBF is a charitable organization, and we believe that through education and support, we can empower families, ensuring they're ready to care for their babies. Please visit our website, consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all our families. And I see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay well.